What's up, everybody? Today, I'm going to be covering off a couple of things. The first is going to be a new product that's coming out on the market that's pretty exciting. Uh, the second is going to be a bit of a cautionary tale. And the third is just going to be, hmm, you'll have to wait and find out. So let's go ahead and roll that intro. What's up, everybody? Okay, so check it out. One of the things that I really do love about being in this industry is you know, finding things out early, getting to hear about them, getting to hear about how they're progressing, actually getting to be involved in some of the trials and, and having some fun with it. So a little over a year ago, maybe, maybe more than that now, uh, a product was brought to my attention called Relzar. Relzar is from Corteva AgriSciences, and it is a broadleaf herbicide that is coming to the market as soon as they are done with very extensive and rigorous testing, and it's awesome. I was, maybe, possibly, going to run sample here, but uh, in talking to uh, the reps and the people that are kind of involved in that, they didn't necessarily want it to be put out on a residential lawn yet, It's so it's in testing with some companies that I do business with right now, which is really cool, and I've gotten to get some feedback on some of that, and that's that's been also pretty exciting. Let me just give you the high points of this real quick. Bear in mind that this is still in testing, preliminary labeling. It has not been approved for everything yet. This is just something that is coming down the pike. So number one, this is a broadleaf weed control. It's a broadleaf weed control that right now there are 60 weeds on the label, most of the common ones that you deal with. This doesn't have sedges on the label. It doesn't have crabgrass on the label, no grassy weeds. It is a broadleaf weed control. Here's the best part about it. The use rate on it is extremely, extremely low. We're only talking about 0.72 ounces per acre, 0.72 ounces per acre. So when it gets sold, it's actually looking at being approved for golf, pro turf, residential, pretty much across the board. And it's gonna be sold in these little tiny blister packs that are like half a milliliter for backpacks. And you know, just try to imagine that for a second. The next thing's this. All turf types. That's right, all turf types. This is both a warm and cool season broadleaf weed control product. Talk about simplifying application for professional applicators and when it does get into the residential use market, so much simpler because you don't have the fear or concern, especially in areas like transition zone where you have different kinds of grasses on the same route. And even in Florida where you might have five or six different types of grasses that you're treating while you're out on a route, or even in your own lawn for that matter, you, you never really know, this gives an awful lot of flexibility to the applicator. Another benefit, which is really cool, is no temperature restrictions. Now that alone is pretty awesome. You know, we have concerns with a lot of broadleaf weed controls. In fact, weed controls in general, that the hotter it gets, you get more of a risk to non-target plant species. And that's something that is always needed to be taken into consideration, is when you start spraying, most labels have a temperature recommendation. And once it goes above that certain temperature, you're gonna run a lot of risk when you're out spraying. So, so far, there is not a top end uh, temperature on this particular product that could happen. So again, some of this stuff, going through extensive trials. It's out being used right now, and, and all of those are going to have to be taken into consideration before final labeling. So you'll find links to this, so you can go check out the uh, Corteva site so that you can actually see everything that this does and some of the lists and the trials that are going on so you can get an idea, but it'll be linked down below. Take a look at it if you want to get further into it. But here's where I wanted to draw some interesting lines, just so everybody can kind of get some perspective on the importance of all of this testing that's going on. So right now, the product Relzar has an active ingredient that they're calling RLX active, and that's a haloxifen methyl. So this is a uh, synthetic auxin, okay, which is great. You're probably familiar with synthetic auxins. Um, it kind of tricks and changes the way that the cell is developing in the plant and ultimately kills the plant. It can't grow properly it dies. It also has an ALS inhibitor on the back side as well, so we've got kind of two modes of action happening there. Also great, fairly common. Now, some of the stuff I'm talking about may sound familiar to some people. So about a decade ago, DuPont, which is part of this Corteva Sciences, because Dow and DuPont merged a few years ago now, 
So they are one company at this point. They had a product out called Imprellis. Now, Imprellis did go through extensive testing, and it was being hailed as an incredible weed control uh, with wonderful residual following behind it. And it covered about 80% of the common turf grasses out there. I don't believe St. Augustine was on the label, but I know Bermuda was, and I know Zoysia was, uh, plus all cool season grasses. So it had a pretty good coverage and the ability to branch between warm and cool season grasses, not 100% of warm season grasses, but you get the idea. So it came out on the market in 2010. Uh, somewhere into 2011, there started to be some issues with trees dying. And in the beginning, it was like Norway spruce trees. And then that sort of spread, I think, to like 10 or 12 different species. So trees were being affected by the active ingredient in Imprellus. So Imprellus had an active ingredient that was also a synthetic auxin, which was aminocyclopyrichlor, potassium salt aminocyclopyrichlor. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that correctly. It's kind of a long word and it's easy to trip over those sometimes. So that had the ability to translocate into the roots of trees and it would kill full grown trees, mature trees, old trees, which obviously caused a big problem for DuPont. There was a subsequent huge lawsuit, uh, multi-billions of dollars in claims, trees replaced all over the country. It mainly started in the Midwest because it kind of went around from where the plant is, uh, I believe in Indiana is kind of where it started and sort of spread out across the Midwest, getting out west. I know in Park City there was a major issue with Imprellis, killed Colorado blue spruce as well. So there were issues. The point of this is that there was a notation in the uh, trials that there was potential damage to two types of trees, but it didn't quite sound so bad, right? There was potential for damage, but it wasn't really horrible. So you can look all of this up. There's tons of information on it. I'll provide a couple links for people to check out as well. Here was this product. It was awesome. It really did well, too well. You know, if you start considering trees to be weeds, then maybe not, but kept the grass clear of weeds, did its job, extremely low use rate, has a lot of very similar characteristics to what we're looking at with this Relzar, which is now still DuPont, Dow, bringing it to market. But there's a lot, a lot more going on to make sure that this is tree safe. In fact, they mentioned that on their website, hardwood tree safe, tree safe, tree safe, tree safe. They're doing extensive studies on that because ultimately, and, th and this is sort of the good news message here that I want to bring to everybody. One of the best things I think that can happen in the chemical world is to lower the amount that's needed to get a desired result. Now, that doesn't mean going off label rates and lowering label rates. In fact, if you go out with less than the amount of product that is designated on the label, you run the risk of building up herbicide resistant plants and nobody wants to do that. That causes problems down the road. Resistance to herbicides and insecticides is becoming a problem. So it's important to note that you put the right amount out. And then again, that you don't go way over the top. So, you know, there's all of these things that there's, there's a middle lane that you need to take and just follow the label and apply the label. Where was I? Coffee to regain my thoughts. Ah, yes, back at it. The good news. I think it's really important to start lowering the amounts of material that goes down in order to get a desired result because it's less contact. It's, it's less uh, potential damage, less fear, I guess, is the best way to put it. I'm not saying that any of these things are damaging to uh, humans or anything else. I'm not saying that. I'm staying far, far away from that. That is an argument for other people. I don't really want to deal with that. What I'm saying is we all do wear our protection. <laughs> Let me rephrase that. We wear our PPE and uh, when we go out, we take certain precautions so that we're not getting exposure and that's really important. So having these lowered use rates, having greater effectiveness and having the ability to have one product that can move through different turf types is going to make a huge difference for everyone. So let me continue on a sort of cautionary tale. Hopefully you're getting something out of this. I think you might be. In my time in the fertilizer industry and now I've been at least part of the horticultural side for 25 years and started doing applications. Oh man, it's 20 years, 20 years. You know, it's, it's been a while. I've seen products come and go, uh, whether that's herbicides, insecticides, um, 
fertilizers even that contained things that shouldn't have been in there. Uh, multiple lawsuits throughout the indus industry. Huge amount of name changes of companies who started out with one thing, kind of tricked the marketplace, and then had to change their names to something else. And, and I want to tell a couple of those tales here real quick. And this has to do with testing and running material and watching what's going on because you don't necessarily know what the final result is going to be unless you've had these multiple field trials. So about a decade ago, we were involved in a field trial on hay, on uh, smooth brome, not, nothing really, not like a high dollar crop or anything, but it was being tested in uh, University of Nebraska at Kearney. And the point of this study was to take some of these uh, plant hormone containing products or straight plant hormone products and see what the overall effect was for growing hay and actually increasing yield and that type of thing. So there were a number of products involved in that. And the main one that we ran, because we didn't really have a huge amount in the line, we actually had a hay product uh, called 20 plus. We put that out there and we put it out at our standard rate. So right out of the gate, you know, that's a fertilizer plus, you know, the kelp and the humic and the fulvic, it has all those extras in it, but it, it kind of can stand alone because it has fertilizer in it. It wasn't really up against other things that had much of a measure of fert. Now, we only put it out at about a quarter pound of N per thousand equivalent. It wasn't very much, uh, you know, it was like 11 pounds of N per acre was the total test. Um, so, so not much. It was still very, very light for what these guys are trying to do for grass hay. A couple of the other products in there was uh, an auxin derived product, uh, an amino product, and a gibberellic acid product. Now, here's what was really interesting to watch. As the study went on uh, and we got the data back and looked at it, the one that exhibited the most extreme growth was a gibberellic acid extract. It was fairly highly concentrated, okay, and I'm going to talk about these concentrations in a second, but it accelerated the growth of the grass. I mean, like, two, three times faster than anything else in the trial. It was nuts. Here's the problem. The grass grew so fast, by the time it hit about six or eight inches tall, it fell over and it couldn't stand up again. It had elongated to such a point that it was not really viable for hay because it was just laid down and stacked on top of each other, and it didn't create a ton of weight. It didn't do much for the roots. It actually ended up stressing out the plant too much and causing issues. The other ones that were more of a measured approach did okay, and they kind of grew the way that they wanted to. Ours, as, as far as length goes, was second place behind the gibberellic acid, but it continued its stand and stayed up, and the amount of grass, viable grass, was huge. It was just, it was much heavier weight, it was denser, it was just an all-around better product. But again, ours contained a measure of N, these other ones didn't. So here's the takeaway. Running something like that, that improves like this massive growth response, but then not coming in behind it and supporting that new foundation always leads to plant damage. Always leads to plant damage. If you trigger a hormonal response or throw just an incredible amount of non-natural growth is the best way to put it. So non-energetic growth, more like cellular push. It's not using nitrogen to grow fast. It's, it's actually its, its own cells being manipulated to grow. If you're not coming back over the top of that with a significant amount more fertilizer to make up for that growth and a significant amount more water, the plant ultimately fails. And so there's a, a cost to result that has to be looked at every single time that happens. Because typically when you bring in some of these, I'll tell you another story. There was another product called OxyGrow. OxyGrow was an MSG product. So that's monosodium glutamate. You don't know what that is. It's a food additive. It triggers responses in the brains, makes the food taste better, also makes you crave more. And the uh, Food and Drug Administration has strict guidelines on uh, MSG being added to plant foods. Well, there was and may still be a company out there. Uh, it was called Oxyan Corp, I believe. And this was going back quite a ways too, into the 90s, that was basically allowing farmers to put MSG out on everything. Now, for some people, that raised some serious alarms because now there was a food additive being put onto crops that was detectable by the time produce made it to market, and that was no good. So that was against federal uh, FDA guidelines. However, the EPA says it's okay. And actually, I still believe they say that spraying MSG is okay. And MSG actually is, again, it comes from an amino acid protein. It throws off a tremendous amount of growth, and it is added into fertilizers without people knowing it 
uh, to boost some performance. But, you know, it's been found out that there's a significant amount of the population that has allergies to MSG. And it's not necessarily the safest thing to put in there. So they were subsequently sued and changed their name and labeling laws and all sorts of things went on with it. And it was a real problem. But ultimately, they were forcing this plant growth. And uh, it, it did increase a certain vegetative growth. But the overall yield difference wasn't really there to justify the cost of this material. So that's where it really comes down to, is when you're starting to look at um, having something that really makes a big difference. And, I, and I'm looking at like this Relzar. There's going to be ease of use. There's going to be incredible, um, an incredible ability to simplify weed control programs. All awesome. It, it'll be very expensive, but I think that the cost will be worth it. When I've seen some of these other materials come onto the market, like these, uh, some of these, well, the MSG one, uh, the gibberellic acid one, the cost is as much as the fertility program was before. So they end up doubling their inputs and actually ending up with either a detriment or a neutral plant. So anyway, all of that. The whole point of this was just to share about this killer new product. Talk a little bit about what it takes in order to bring something to market and what things have to be considered and what to look out for. And I just wanted everybody to know this is something cool that's coming down the pike. So before I sign off, this is what I want to say. There's a couple of things that I'm going to be getting into. Now, just to give you a little clue, the next video is basically going to be about weedy grass identification, crabgrass identification, and controls in crabgrass. I want to go ahead and do that because I've been seeing a lot of posts online of people trying to kill crabgrass that wasn't crabgrass. So we need to make sure we have a bit of a refresher on what you're looking at to make sure that you're actually going after the correct target pest with the correct herbicide very important. So that's going to be coming very quickly after this video. Here's a sign off. There's actually a chance of snow. It was snowing a little while ago, believe it or not, and rain coming today. I have not fed my lawn in five weeks. It's been five weeks. It was actually in the snow the last time that happened. It's apparently I just only feed when there's snow. So I've got to do that today. I'm letting the grass grow up a little bit longer right now. It's getting up a little higher. It's been really super dry lately. So I want to get advantage of that rain coming. I'm going to give it 1801 at 16 ounces per thousand. I'm going to go ahead and hit it with humic uh, at six ounces per thousand. That's going down today. So if anybody's following along with their program, that's what's happening today. And that, my friends, is it for me. And I will talk to y'all real soon. See ya.